I'm here to tell you that we're different at all scales, from our faces to our minds to the molecules that make up both. If you look at this beautiful crowd at the, in the audience of the Oscars, and you merged and averaged all their faces together, you'd lose the interesting and beautiful pieces, you'd lose detail, and that's true all the way down to single molecules. Let me first introduce you to the tiny world in which I spend hours every day. So I think many of you are familiar with the scale of cells in the upper left. If we go down more than a factor of 1,000, we get to the width of a single DNA molecule, but I work at still smaller scales, looking at the smallest switches and motors, exploring the rules of miniaturization as we get down to the ultimate limits, trying to take what we learn from the synthetic systems we build, in which every atom is in position, as well as biological systems, so that we can learn to apply those in the world we live in to make more efficient and more understandable devices. To our amazement, in these synthetic systems that we built, which were intentionally identical one to the next, we found that even there, there was tremendous variation for the identical molecule or two of the same molecules just spaced a few nanometers apart on a surface. And we've learned to operate these with chemistry, uh, with electrons, with light, and so forth. And it's still an area we're exploring. We've gotten the first results now where we can get these molecules to start to work together. So in 2002, a brilliant and beautiful colleague, Ann Andrews, walked into my lab and said, why are you doing all of this? Okay. And, and that was crushing, actually. Uh, and, and I asked her uh, what we should be doing. And she suggested uh, that we join forces and learn to understand the brain at the nanoscale at which it at which it functions. So I did the three most obvious things. Number one, I took her class in brain chemistry, and I got the lowest possible passing grade on the entrance exam. <laughs> but I stayed and audited. I didn't take any more tests after that. <laughs> I'm not that bad, yeah. So uh, then uh, we joined forces, and as you can see, the scale of the smallest electronic devices that we now use in our computers and cell phones actually matches the scale at which there's chemical information transfer between neur neurons and synapses. And the third thing I did was marry her. <laughs> yeah. And it turns out at even smaller scales, the scales at which we've been working in our lab, at some time, we have access to the molecules that participate in that information transfer and that have been tremendously difficult to study, but important as the target of half of all drugs. So let's uh, go on further. In addition to losing information when we average people together, we lose information when we average molecules together. The standard way to determine the structures of molecules, making crystals out of them, and looking at the patterns when you scatter x-rays through them, as Rosalind Franklin did, and with her data, Watson and Crick determined the structure of double helix DNA, those structures lose a tremendous amount of information because of averaging. Right? It took decades and new technologies and new methods until we could sequence the DNA of people, compare individuals, compare ourselves to other species, and to start to, to decode what I would call the first book of life, our genomes. And those technologies have much further to go to start to understand the differences between the individual molecules as opposed to uh, the sequences that make us up. Okay. So really, the, the genome, our genome, and other genomes, as we've decoded them, are just the start of the story. To our surprise, the three billion letter long code of the human genome translated into only 21,000 genes by our best current estimates. It turns out, though, with those 21,000 genes, through mixing and matching, through chemical modifications of the proteins that were produced, leave us with one million different proteins. Okay? About 30% of those are only expressed in our brains. And those proteins and the places we find them are very dependent on our genetics, on our environment, and on the context of the nanoscale environment around them. So, what are we trying to do? 
uh, first at the very smallest scales. We're trying to get at these proteins that, number one, you can't make crystals out of them easily, so they're difficult to study by conventional means. Although we know the structures of 90,000 proteins, we know the structures are fewer than 20 of these membrane-associated proteins that are so important in our brains and so important to current therapies. At the larger scales, we're developing technologies to try and understand the interactions of neurons. And so by merging nanoscience and nanotechnology with neuroscience, rather than measuring single neurons or low-resolution scans of our brains, as we heard about earlier today, we want to understand the chemical and electrical interactions of neurons that make up circuits, and thus our thoughts and memories, and the difference between a functioning brain and a malfunctioning brain in disease. Okay. So we brought together a team at UCLA to do this. Uh, we hired Satiris Masmonitis from Caltech, who can do 5,000 electronic measurements at a time in a brain. We've converted him from doing electronic measurements also to doing chemical measurements. Our partners at Stanford have developed optical microscopes that can measure 1,000 neurons at a time, and we're working our way up to on the order of a million, which we think is a, a key point for starting to understand uh, pieces of the brain. A little bit of background. In addition to the electronic part of our brain, we have a hundred different chemical channels that communicate with each other uh, between neurons. There are 85 billion neurons with a hundred trillion of those connections. This is an enormous analytical problem, an enormous mathematical problem, an enormous computational problem. And there are a number of ways people have proposed to study the brain. There are groups that take a snapshot and cut brains up in little slices and figure out where all the physical connections were in that snapshot in time, but that doesn't tell us how we learn and forget function and malfunction. There are people who treat the brain like a computer and always do voltage measurements, electronic measurements. Those are uh, more straightforward to do and the technologies are more advanced. Our group, I would say, leads in the dynamic chemical measurements where we can look at these very heterogeneous networks and how they interact with one another. And then there are people, especially a group in Europe, that's trying to do computer simulations of how the brain works that we think we'll be able to test uh, with the kind of measurements uh, we're doing. Okay. So uh, a couple of years ago, more nanoscientists and neuroscientists started to get together. As far as I know, none of them have gotten married yet. Uh, <laughs> But we started uh, talking to each other, arguing over uh, what it is we'd like to measure. Uh, there was a group that proposed treating the brain like a computer and measuring voltages in parallel to the great extent that we could. Uh, we responded uh, saying, don't forget about the chemistry, uh, the nature, and our brains preserve that chemistry at great cost and will miss a key opportunity to study the differences between functioning brains and diseased brains both from the point of view of addressing diseases, but also from the point of view of control experiments that nature has given us to understand what the difference between function and malfunction is. And so we actually won that argument, and we joined with about two dozen other scientists to discuss the technologies that needed to be developed to do these uh, key measurements to accelerate advances in neuroscience by targeting uh, technology, technological development in uh, nanoscience, math, computer science, and other areas. Uh, we were uh, privileged to be at President Obama's announcement of the Brain Initiative back in April, where this became a national program uh, designed to last about 15 years to the point of understanding uh, parts of our brain and what thoughts, uh, memories, and diseases were. And uh, I think what you'll find on this stage and other stages, on this red dot and other red dots over the next few years, over the advances uh, that come out of that initiative and the work that we and others around the world are now doing. In the meantime, I would task each of you to enjoy and appreciate uh, the differences in each other and the differences within each of you. Thank you. <laughs>